Uh, hello and, and welcome everybody. If you're, if you're still walking by or if you've already sort of walked past and you're thinking, hey, I can hear somebody talking, well, come on back. There, there are a bunch of seats waiting for you. Um, hello, my, my name is Alejo Benedetti. I'm curator of contemporary art here at Crystal Bridges and uh, I have the amazing privilege of getting to work on the newest exhibition to, to open at Crystal Bridges. It's called Navigating Lola Lop Lop. Uh, and I am joined today by Stephanie, uh, who's from uh, Arkansas Coalition of Marshallese, who are our, uh, our partners to create this, uh, this exhibition. Um, so for, first off, welcome, Stephanie. Thank you, Aleo. Como <laughs> uh, this, is, this is gonna be casual. This is going to be, uh, Stephanie and I ha have been working on, uh, on this project along with a whole host of different folks from uh, from ACOM, which is which is Arkansas Coalition of Marshallese, and uh, we <laughs> we're just going to talk about what 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 is up there in in the galleries right now. Uh, but I think the the best place to start is for us to start with uh, how how this all sort of came about, how the how the relationship between ACOM and Crystal Bridges really started. Thank you, Alejo. Um, first of all. If you guys all know, Crystal Bridges is really big on uplifting indigenous people. Here in Northwest Arkansas with the current census, there's about 14,000 of us Pacific Mar um, Marshallese here. But I think that data is not correct because it was in the midst of the pandemic. So I believe we have a higher number than that. Um, but three years ago, Crystal Bridges uh, and ACOM sat at the table and thought, how can we partner? How can we uplift the Marshallese people and just um, let the people know that we are here? So we had built a trusted relationship in the last three years. Um, our first project was with the big canoe outside. That was carved in 2021. In the midst of the pandemic, I remember delivering food to the elders that were carving that canoe in the middle of the pandemic while we were trying to make sure that um, project was finished and you know done the, the right way. But anyways, that's been three years and I think that's where the conversation came is how can we partner and uplift the indigenous people? And when you talk about indigenous, you're talking specifically about the Marshallese people. Absolutely, yeah, and and one of the one of the coolest things about the you know the very first work that people see when they when they come into the lobby right now is this incredible canoe that was uh, that was carved by a master carver that lives here, which is one of the things, and and then also using wood that was actually from a tree that that had fallen on Crystal Bridges campus, and so. All of those different things are are, are so uh, are, are so important because I think there's a little reminder there that uh, the the master carver that did that, Litan, is here. He's he's living here, and that that this is as as you say, more than fourteen thousand uh, Marshallese people living here in Northwest Arkansas. Um, can, can you talk a little bit about? Um, about that sort of, uh, I mean, ACOM's role, the sort of relationship with uh, with the um, with the Marshallese population that's here, um, yeah. So the theme of the event is called Navigating Lale Lop Lop. Lale Lop Lop was our actually indigenous name. If you guys know, the name Marshall Islands does not belong to us. It belongs to a um, explorer, a Captain John Marshall. So that's where our name came from. That specific European captain. Um, but our, peop our organizations here to uplift our marshless people, we want to make sure that they're navigating the different life systems that are, you know, put in place here. Like, for example, you have the school systems, you have the health system, you have the legal system. Our organization steps in bridge that gap between our own people because I always, we always think about if you were to move to a different country, you don't speak the language, you don't know the culture, you don't know the the way of life. So that's where our organization comes and gaps that bridge between our people. So yeah, that's where we think about navigating. We're not just talking about the exhibit and the way we navigate at the oceans. We always put that theme into our helping our people by helping them navigate their lives. Well, and I, I, I love that you brought that up because uh, yeah, it's like all these different layers of, uh, of navigation that, that come into how uh, Throughout the planning process of the exhibition, that we were, it's like, yeah, it's navigating, it's navigating COFA, it's navigating all uh, all the different systems that are here that are different from from being in the Marshall Islands, and then also, as you as you said, navigation as uh, navigating the ocean, and and there are uh, a couple really beautiful objects that are included in the in the exhibition that directly point to this idea of navigation. Um, could you talk about maybe maybe one of those objects? 
Yeah, so the stick chart, yeah. um, the stick chart, you'll see it in there. Our ancestors, when they navigated the ocean, I learned this recently. So I moved here when I was 11. I'm almost 40. So I'm what they want to consider someone that's very, very Americanized for a, a Marshallese person. And so with the stick charts, I just learned that our ancestors put that into place. But back in the, we actually still have about a handful of navigators that navigate the ocean by just looking at the alignments of the stars, um, determining the wind, determining the waves, the tides of the waves, and they can go from point A to point B in the middle of the dark without having issues. And they can actually pinpoint exactly where they're at. But yeah, that stick chart, I just learned recently about it because I get to work closely with the elders now. And so when they're teaching me all this stuff, it's really interesting and really important that I'm trying to hold on to that because in the future, I'm the next elder. And in our community, our elders are who we always look up to for wisdom and for someone, uh, the people that always hold on to our culture, roots, and traditions, yeah. Well, and I, I love that you bring that up because uh, one, one of the phrases that, that I kept hearing early on when we first started, started talking uh, was, was this phrase, uh, hold on to your manet. And, and I wonder if you could speak a little bit about, about that phrase and, and that sort of idea and, and how that uh, maybe plays out either in the exhibition or just in some of the, the work that, that ACOM does. Yeah, so Rebek Manido, hold on to your manet, means hold on to your roots, traditions, and culture. This is something that I remember as a two-year-old child. Um, my grandparents, the elders surrounding me, would say, Rebek Manido, hold on to your roots and your culture. Um, now that I, like I mentioned, I'm, I'm almost 40, in the next 30 years, when I look around, it's not going to be just me. It's not going to be my elders that are not going to be available to speak on to the community. I'll be the next one that they're gonna call up to speak. So it's really important that I hold on to my roots and culture right now because in the future, it's gonna be my children and grandchildren that are gonna, I'm gonna to have to teach them that now. So yeah, that's really, it's really interesting to see that I didn't hold on to that when I was a child, but now that I'm older, I see a lot of my generation wanting to hold on to the knowledge, wealth, and wisdom that our ancestors and elders have held for thousands of years. Well, and, and also understanding, I, I think that the, there, there are these traditions, there's this knowledge that, that needs to be preserved and maintained and, and practiced. And also that the, some of these, that the, there's space for change and that there's space for, that this is a culture that is alive and well. And, uh, and when we look at some of the works that are in the show, the, the work that immediately comes to mind for me is, is Helmar's work. Um, and the really beautiful mat that, that he's done that, that, that is very much looking at tradition and also introducing right now. Uh, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, about Helmar's work. And the jaggi, the mat that is on the wall in the exhibit, you'll see it has got beautiful bright um, spray paints on it. That mat has been used um, for thousands of years. Um, actually, if you guys get a chance, go down by the wa lander, walking lander. Oh. Walking Walk Lander. Walk Walk Lander, and there's some uh, weavers down there that these ladies have learned their skills of weavings from their mother, grandmother, great-grandmother. You're talking 40 generations back. It's really interesting that we had incorporated that and approached artist Helmar and asked him, can he put something in there that's more modernized? Um, in the same concept, he came back and put the word David Manadeo but it's in spray paints. We don't have spray paint back home. And so it's really cool to see that older traditional art incorporated into this newer modernized art that Helmar had spray painted on there. But the word David Manado is still ingrained into holding on to your culture. Uh, w one of the things when we first started talking about doing this exhibition, and, and again, I, as you said, like this relationship has been going on for, for a while, um, but when we first started thinking about how do, we, how do we realize this as an exhibition, one of the first things that, that, uh, that you and Melissa had said um, was, okay, we need, to, we need to do a listening session. We need to, it can't just be us. It can't just be uh, the, like a handful of people figuring out what's going to be in this exhibition. And, and so we set up a, it was, it was a day in December, or it was an evening in December. Uh, there, were, there, there were different prompts that were going to be there. Uh, there, were, uh, there was food that was there. Uh, there was lots of conversation. And, uh, and, and I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, you know, what, why that, that approach was so, so important and what, what some of those different ideas that, that maybe came out of uh, having the conversation with uh, a whole bunch of different people from the, uh, from the community. So when we had that tabling session with 
our, the Marshalls community, we had a bunch of our, again, elders. <laughs> I always mention the elders because they're so important, dear to us. Um, a couple of, one thing that I really took that night was learning that if you guys will go into the exhibit, you guys will see and learn more about the nuclear legacy that our people hold. Um, it was really interesting for me to learn that after the U.S. bombed our islands um, and didn't know the ramifications of nuclear poisoning, they put our people back on the island and gave them preserved canned food. So when those food ran out, our people were now forced to eat off of the land. You're talking pandanas, banana fruits, uh, coconuts, and then, of course, fishing. So when the U.S. came back again to see the results of that, the U.S. military, they came to find out that radiation poisoning is really bad because they got to see uh, moms giving birth to jelly babies. They got to see cancer just running rampant with these people. So that was really interesting for me to learn that. That was actually new. Um, so I took that a lot back, um, back that night and just thought really hard about, wow, okay, our people did suffer and they were, did, they were used as, um, I don't know how to say the word, but they were used as testings to see what the nuclear effects would be. And this is how the U.S. used us to advance their knowledge in, in nuclear weapons. Well, and, and this is something that I, I distinctly remember in, in the listening session. Um, there was, uh, there was one, one woman that had stood up and she said, you know, the, the nuclear legacy is something that we, we have to talk about in this show. It, it needs to be part of the conversation. But also, uh, as you're going into this, as we're thinking about how we set up this show, uh, we need to mention it. We need to talk about it. We can't hide it. Uh, but we also can't be defined by it. And so, so I wonder, I, I was so moved by, by that idea. Uh, and also, um, you know, I, I f the nuclear legacy is definitely part of this exhibition. And I wonder if you could talk about how we, uh, how we approached it and how it sort of lives in, the, uh, in this sort of larger exhibition story. So we listen to the nuclear victims and the word victims is something that you know, as, as native indigenous from the nuclear le legacy is not something that we want to be defined by. We want to be defined by survivors. We are gonna, we're here to, in, in Northwest Arkansas and a lot of them are thriving and they're, being, they're leading successful lives here. Um, one thing that I re really wanted to mention was our people, especially the nuclear victims, my grandparents actually got to see the nuclear testing, you know, when it blew from across the ocean. They remember just seeing like the effects stuff and I've been told that um, but one thing I can say about our people we are some of the most forgiving people you will never see our people say oh it's their fault it's their fault we want this we want to be justified for this we're forgiving and you know we're, we're living hand in hand with the American people despite what happened to us and we you will never hear any of them complain about it like on a different level but yeah I mean that's where that exhibit comes from was just trying to let people be aware of what happened to our people. It did happen, but we're not defined by victims. We are the, we're, they're survivors. Well, and, and one, of the, one of the other things that, that people see as they, as, they go into, uh, as they go into the exhibition, uh, there is, it's sort of set off into, uh, we call it the, the sort of niche area, uh, and there is a, a video uh, by, by Kalud, um, who is a, a local artist um, and, uh, and, and a collaborator with, with ACOM and with Crystal Bridges for a number of years now. Um, and, and one of the things that's really uh, moving for me about that is the, the way that Kalud approached telling that, that nuclear legacy story is, uh, is from a personal connection. And, and understanding that, again, there's so many ways that, that this can be understood from, from a metric side of things, from a number side of things. Uh, and then there's something totally different uh, when, you, when you are able to hear a person tell their story about it. Uh, and and I, I don't know if you have any, any sort of additional reflections on, uh, on Kalud's video or, or on, uh, on some of those ideas. So coming to the exhibit earlier, there's a couple of people that says, why Northwest Arkansas? Um, a lot of our people are here because we've been displaced. There was three islands that were completely um, decimated by the nuclear. So when we put that video up, it's to tell people that we are here because we're displaced. We're not here for handouts. We want to live here. We want to be a thriving community. Um, so that's where the idea came from. I mean, I think that's where Kalu's video is really amazing, but it really talks about we are here it mentions that 
as Marshall's people, we are part of that nuclear legacy. Um, and so that's really great to have that up there to educate people on what happened to our people. Well, and, and one of the things that, uh, that, that I think is, is, is people walk into the exhibition, one of the things that um, I think is sort of a great shout out to ACOM's presence here. Uh, one of the biggest events that, that y'all do uh, is, is Stroll the Atolls. And uh, there's a dress that, that is in the exhibition that was worn at the last uh, Stroll the Atolls. And, uh, and, and I wonder if you could maybe talk a little bit about that dress, um, and, then, and, and then we'll sort of switch over to, to the other dress that's in there too. So the Stroll the Atolls, um, we conduct this big, um, I want to say it's a party. <laughs> it's a big event that we conduct, and we usually shut downtown Springdale for it. And we, during that time, we always try to think of how do we elevate our people. So one way was starting the fashion show, the Marshalls Fashion Show. And what we have done is we always love seeing our younger generation thrive, the youth. So all our seamstresses, we will gather them and say, hey, can you take one young youth and design something that's traditional? So that traditional wear on there, Miss um, Prasanna Lawin, she is a seam seamstress. Um, she, since that theme for Stroll the Atolls was navigation again, we're talking back about navigation. She incorporated this stick chart on, on the youth's um, outfit. And so that's really neat that you still have the history into that dress with that navigation stick chart that she put on there. Uh, at the same time, you have the modernized version of like your, she used some silk, some plastic in there with the little uh, embroidery. Um, so yeah, it's really cool to see that. But at the same time, it was really neat to see the, the fashion walk, uh, how do you call it? Yeah, like on the run. The model, the model, yeah. <laughs> the model just, you know, strutted down. She's a native Marshallist, but she just loved it and just rocked that outfit on the, on the runway. Yeah. Well, and, and, and I love that. And the, and the dress is, is so cool. And it's, in, and it's sort of amazing wow. to see how it kind of interacts with the, uh, with the other objects that are in the exhibition. Um, I, I want to shift our focus to the other dress that is in there, uh, which has a very different story, uh, but is stunning. Just absolutely stunning. As soon as you walk in, you're going to be drawn to to this hot pink dress. Yeah, so the pink dress, you'll see it as the hottest pink dress in the exhibit when you go in. Um, that dress is actually someone's great-grandmother's, and it's been loaned to Crystal Bridges for on display. But as a child, um, I remember my grandmothers and great-grandmothers wearing them to church. So when you, what you will see is a traditional dress that would be used mainly for churches, sometimes for baby's first birthday, for marriage, for weddings, um, and then, of course, for death as well. Um, but that dress signifies how, as Marshallese women, we became modest. Because when I talk about the gospel, when the gospel was brought back into our islands in the 1800s by the Bostonian Protestants, um, when they came off those ships, all the ladies were topless. But being topless in our, in our, with our people, it was never sexualized. It was to... It, the breasts were available at all times to feed a child. So when the gospel came in, that's when they start uh, developing the Victorian style cover-up dresses now. And so as it evolved throughout the years, I think a few decades later, that's where it evolved into that kind of dress. So it's really interesting to see how our indigenous wore, uh, wore traditional uh, mat dresses where they were topless to now were covered because of modesty and of how the gospel has impacted our, our you know, culture and, and traditions, yeah. Well, and, and the gospel is something that, that has come up uh, so, so many times throughout the, the sort of conversations and the planning process. Uh, and so it is one of the sections that's, that's in the, the exhibition. And, and the way that it, it's sort of held down is by um, uh, there's, a, there's a Bible that's in Marshallese that, that uh, a, a member of the community has lent to the show, which is, which is uh, wonderful. And then there are also, um, there's a collection basket and there's also um, a, a series of ornaments that are on, uh, on the wall as well. Uh, and, and I wonder if you could speak a little bit more about uh, the, the role that the gospel plays and then uh, if there's a specific one of those objects that you wanna uh, talk about a little bit more, um, that, that would be great. Yeah, so when the gospel came, we mentioned about um, the gospel came from the Protestants back in the 1800s. Um, we were what they wanna call lost. That's what our chiefs uh, mentioned. But when they brought the gospel back into our islands and I introduced it to high chief, the high chief started calling his people and say, hey, there, there's some truth behind this. And so um, 
as the years has gone, we have now incorporated the gospel into our traditions very much so. 90% of our people are Christian Christians. Even if you take into Catholicism, Protestant, um, Assembly of God, we still consider everyone all across the board as Christians. Um, so today, if you go to a Marshallese baby's first birthday, that signifies that child's first, um, they, they actually, when they make their first birthday, that justifies that they have gone through the worst phase of possibly dying at an early age. So when you go to a birthday, you usually have a pastor that we will bring and they will start the events with a prayer. And at the end of it, once we close, sometimes we'll hold our parties until three in the morning. It's very common. Um, we always have someone close it out in prayer. And so that's not just in, in uh, birth, birthdays, that's usually in marriage as well and in death as well. Those are the three significant events that happens in a Marshall's life. life. Um, so yeah, it's really cool to see that even today when I go to uh, someone invited me to their wedding, you know, you know that it's already given. We're going to all stand up and bow our heads and pray and uh, open that event with prayers at all time. Uh, one of the... Uh one of the components of the exhibition that, that was really important was um, having, having some sort of opportunity for folks to really feel the different materials because they're beautiful handicrafts that are, that, that are all, uh, all throughout this exhibition, whether it's purses or jewelry um, and, uh, or, or the mats. Uh, and a lot of times it comes back to just a couple materials. And so there is a, a touch station where folks are able to touch some of these. I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, uh, about um, these different materials. Um, and, and then we'll also, we'll, we'll talk about the, the painting in a second, but yeah. Um, so as I'm like, in the last four years, I've been real, working real close with our elders. Um, one of the, um, pen, one of the, hands-on experience that you'll have in there for that little weave, uh, little leaf is um, going to be the pandanus and the coconut leaf. When you have a pandanus and a coconut leaf, uh, when they're healthy, it's always green. But I just learned, learned recently from the elders that it takes days, sometimes weeks, to get that material to where it should be. Um, they will take that leaf off of the tree when it's bright and green. They'll lay it out into the sun, ha wait till it turns brown. I've had grandmas tell me that they sometimes will use coral for coloring as well. That was really interesting to learn that. But they would cook it, pound it, dry it, cook it, pound it, dry it. So what you see there was a lot of work. It's not just a raw material. It's a raw material that someone had to put love and labor into. Yeah, so that's both the coconut. One of the thinner ones are coconut frongs that were stripped. And then the thicker uh, material is actually the pendanus leaves. Well, and, and also, and, and you mentioned that, you know, these, these are materials that, that get treated. These are materials that, um, that, that have a lot of labor that goes into it. And even right next to those materials is a, a, a carving stone. And so one of these tools that, that is um, re really uh, essential to, uh, to the sort of creation of these really beautiful objects, um, which... Uh, which I just wanted to, to sort of call out because that's a, uh, that's a sort of surprising object for some people, I think, to walk in and see. And also so exciting that, that we were able to, to borrow one, uh, this really important object from, uh, from the community. So that regainin, which is a, it's a molcajete, how do Hispanics, molcajete is what, what they pound their food in. Um, so you'll see it, it's a little brown stick that's what's been used for thousands of years. And that stick is specifically used to pound, again, the raw materials of coconut trees, coconut leaves, um, the pendant leaves. Without that material, we couldn't pound our food to have food on the table. We couldn't pound uh, the mats to put clothing around us. We couldn't pound the raw materials, again, to make mats for us to sleep in. So that's a really significant uh, piece of tool that you will see in the exhibit. That's actually made out of a wood, a really raw wood. But I learned from our master carver, Lita and Beaza, that we do have rock ones too. And he told me that on his island, Namrik, they will bring a big old stone and put it on the lining of the ocean because when the waves are coming, they're, they're slowly carving away at it until, and then every now and then they'll come and adjust it. So now they get the thinner version part of it. But that was really interesting to learn that, you know, that's how they um, carve the stones because it's always been, I've always been curious about it. Um, but yeah, without that tool that you will see there is a um, we wouldn't, you know, it, we, 
we would be not thriving as community without it because it is definitely a tool that we've used for generations. Well, and, and I mentioned the, the painting that's in close proximity to, uh, to the touch station and to the, the raw materials. Um, and you have a very, uh, very direct uh, relationship with, uh, with that painter and with that painting. Um, and so I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about wh what are we seeing in, in that painting and who made that painting? So on the painting, the oil painting canvas that you'll see, um, my great uncle, that's my mother's grandmother's brother, he painted that back in the 1990s. I gotta look at the date on there, sorry if I got it wrong. Um, but I remember sitting, it was really big that a lot of us growing up, a lot of us kids would just surround the foot of our grandparents and just listen to them talk about their way of life or even like story folklore telling. Um, but when I talked to my grandma and my great great uncle about uh, the, my great uncle about the painting they mentioned that that's what they envision as children they remembered that specifically it took a community to build a house it took a community to feed everybody else while the women were behind you know taking care of cleaning up each other's houses and help nursing babies or you know sharing responsibilities to help, as a community it takes a community to raise a child that's a true saying but he they remember men would go out and fish bring back the fish and then they will all sit as a community and eat outside at the end of the day. So that painting depicts exactly what my elders remember as children, as little kids. So that's what he had painted to keep that memory alive for his, um, he said that he actually wanted those paintings to be um, painted just so he can have something to pass down to our, our future generations, so. I love that. Um, w w one of the things that, you know, when folks walk in, they will see that there are these different, uh, different themes that, and different sections of this exhibition. And one of the things that um, that has been so exciting is to is to see how these different themes interact with one another. That um, you know, when we start a conversation, we're talking about the land, um, or we start a conversation, we're talking about the gospel. We we can't help but also talk about uh, you know, like w one of these other um, like the nuclear legacy, or also talking about um, the, the these different ways that all of these. Uh, these different components work together and there's an interconnectedness uh, that runs throughout this exhibition. And so I, I wonder if you could, could talk about maybe a, a little bit of that, how, how some of these ideas sort of uh, weave together and how some of them, um, like if we're talking about um, navigation, we're also probably gonna talk about, uh, about the land in some way. And so. Yeah, so when, with the theme of the, um, of the exhibit, it's really interesting to see that it's all like Everything is interconnected together. We talk about navigating, we mentioned earlier, navigating the different systems in the US. Um, talk about, there's the, we are the people wall. Uh, we always come together in one. Um, one thing about our people is we can trace our lineage 10 generations back. I can't, <laughs> my elders can. Um, but that talks about how we all come as one as a community. Um, because without these different conversations or what the, the different themes in there, it wouldn't define us as we, it wouldn't, it really does explain who we are as a people. And so without those different themes, it would definitely disconnect us as one, if that makes sense. So it's really cool to see that exhibit come together. And at the end of it, it talks about the Marshallist people as one community. Um, we come together and we are always going to be, you know, taking care of each other and, and uphold onto our roots and cultures. Yeah. That's that, that's excellent. Um, I I I want to be uh, mindful of time because I I wanted to make sure that we had an opportunity to open this up for for questions um, because we I think we could continue talking, um, but I, I think if folks uh, if folks out here have some questions to ask, um, this would be a perfect time for it. Um, so if if you want to just raise your hand and uh, and just shout it out, yeah. Sure. So I, I, so thank you for, for that question. I'll just sort of repeat it so, so everybody can hear, but the question was about um, the, the fact that uh, the Marshall Islands um, is surrounded by water, and then uh, w what's the sort of uh, effect uh, of having, uh, moving to Northwest Arkansas, which is very landlocked, 
um, and, and the sort of differences, even just sort of geographically between these two places? Um, I think talking about how we are now having to find a new way of life outside of our comfort zone. Um, one thing is we don't hold on to our island. We do love our island. That's our home. That's our motherland. But when you come, believe it or not, every weekend here in Northwest Arkansas, there's probably like 12 parties. And when you're talking 12 parties, you're tracing 10 generations back. Everyone's invited. So at the end of the, par at the, end of the day, when you have everyone collected, you'll have about 2,000 people at a baby's one uh, first birthday. So we still try to hold on to our tr roots and roots and cultures and tradition, I think that's really important because we do get homesick. But when you come together as one as a community, we all feel like we're home. Because where our people is, we are home. If that makes sense. Um, are, are there other questions that folks have? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so, so the question was just, um, what, what is the Arkansas connection? Uh, what, why is there this population of Marshallese people in, uh, in Arkansas? Yeah, so on the exhibit wall, you will see on one of, I believe the first wall we were gonna walk by, it mentions about a gentleman named John Moody back in the 1980s when the COFA um, argument between the US was conducted and it was solidified. Um, John Moody went to school here on scholarship, I think, believe in Missouri. And he said, okay, once he was done with school, he moved to Northwest Arkansas to look for a job. And he found the Tyson plants, the poultry production. So John Moody called this, just an example, I'm probably not right, call his brother, brother brought himself, brother works, brother brought his wife, wife brought in cousin, her cousin. So it's just has grown again. And of course, all of us are interconnected in some ways. We're related. <laughs> again, when you talk about the lineage tracing from 10 generations back, um, everyone's here now. But 1980s, if I'm correct. Yes, the 1980s. And now um, with the census, they said in 2021, we have 14,000. But like I mentioned earlier, that was during the pandemic. How accurate is that? I believe we have more than that. So the poultry production is what moved the Marshallese people here. We do love our chicken. <laughs> uh, I, I think you had your hand up first. What's the population of the islands? So the question, what's the population in the islands? Um, with the recent census, again, the Marshallese conducted a census back in 2021 as well. Um, it's at 39,000, if I'm correct. But now we are like almost surpassing that. Another reason a lot of our people are moving here as well, if you guys don't know this, uh, the displacements of the nuclear legacy, one of them is global warming. Um, we, if you guys look up on YouTube, you'll see people's homes back home just being eradicated by king tides. People talk and mention that um, global warming's not real. It hap it's happening. We're, gonna, we're actually one of the first islands that will eventually be overtaken by uh, global warming, for sure. Um, and I believe you had a question? Oh, yeah, the, the question was, uh, what, what is COFA? Um. COFA is called Compact of Free Association. In 1986, the U.S. and the Marshall Islands, just because of the nuclear legacy, um, after going back and forth for decades, finally agreed that um, the Marshallese can move here. Now, when I talk about Marshallese, not just us, because not just the Marshall Islands got impacted, the Federated State of Micronesia got impacted, the, uh, the island of Palau got impacted. So when you talk about Kofa, you're talking about the Marshallese people, the Marshall Islands, the FSM, Federal State of Micronesians, which is like Pompeii, uh, Kustraya, all of them, and then of course, State of Palau. We all came together as nations to uh, let the US know that we did, we need to have some sort of agreement um, so that way we can uh, try to get some wants to justice for the nuclear legacy. So that was drafted. It was um, recently we just, uh, President Biden just signed into law the newest COFA in last year. Or no, this year, I'm sorry, March 18th, if I'm correct. So that's the second COFA, Compact of Free Association, that was um, signed into law. Um, and any more questions? I think we have, we have time for, for a couple more. Yeah.
Uh, yeah, uh, the, the, the question was, was about, um, uh, we know that folks have, have been in the, the Marshall Islands for a very long time. Do, do we have, uh, or is there some sort of knowledge of uh, where folks may have uh, sailed from or how they would have gotten there? Or, or it, it, if we do know. Yeah, the, the history there is unknown, um, but I know for myself, this is what, um, what they wanted, what they consider 100% Marshallese native. Um, I conducted a DNA swab, sent it over to a lab, and we just wanted to cure it, very curious about who I am. Um, it was 92% Asian dye, which is really interesting. It's like a part of like Vietnam, China, it's like in that ocean. So I'm always curious if our ancestors navigated down, down towards our island, went towards uh, Japan, came down to our island. I do have Japanese in my genetics as well. Uh, Peruvian, in, interesting, but it's always, I've always been interested, did, did the Chinese, the Asians, you know, migrated towards the islands, so, but that's the only thing I've learned, I mean, but as far as who we are, who, who we, who we came from, that's the unknown, 